Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. How are you? Thanks so much for joining me and welcome to 10 second albums to buy from the biggest band. So this video here is actually a follow up to 10 first albums to buy from the biggest bands. For that video, we covered all of the monumental albums, the groundbreaking, the biggest sellers, that sort of stuff, or at least for the most part, right? The ones that people talk about all the time and the ones at least I think had the biggest hits and the most renowned and that sort. But Hey, what is the second album that people should buy from these amazing big bands that are out there? After you've picked up all of that other stuff, this is that list. And I'm sure we're going to have some differences on there. I've been collecting for over 35 years. I've got 12,000 CDs in my collection. And this at least is what I think should be the second albums that are bought by these biggest bands. We'll dive into that here in just a bit. But before we start, if you're new to my channel, if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please do. Also, leave a comment, hit like. All those things do help support my channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus, if you turn on notifications, you're going to stay up to date on everything going on in the world of music, just like this, with 10 second albums to buy from the biggest bands, right? If you saw the first one, you didn't have notifications turned on, you might miss this one. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and dive into it. I have organized these by year. So we are going to start off in 1972 with Yes, Close to the Edge, their fourth studio album that would go on to sell 1 million copies in the U.S. So after exploring their most popular album, 90125, with all the 80s synth sounds and everything in it, where they had really sort of minimized or pulled to the back their prog rock songs, you know, sound to them and everything, we're going to move into that prog rock era of the 70s. The thing that made Yes, Yes, that made them famous long before the song Owner of a Lonely Heart ever did. And in this particular case, I'm going to say it's this album that you should go for. So, the album itself is not only a prog rock masterpiece, but it's one of those ones where uh, they have really kind of maxed it out. So there's only three songs on here, making each one really long. Side One has the title track close to the edge on it, clocking in at 18 minutes and 43 seconds. So an entire side of an album is one of the songs. Side Two and You and I, which is 10 minutes and 12 seconds. And there's an edited version of that song that eventually went to number 42 on the Billboard chart. Uh, track number two, Siberian Katra, is 8 minutes and 56 seconds. That is another pretty well-known song by the band, even in its full-length form. But the album itself just has all the early hallmarks of Yes on here. Rock fused with classical elements, acoustic instrumentation mixed in with their electronic sound, and you get that complex technical mastery of each instrument on here. Not that this stuff did not appear on the 90125 album that came later, but this is really where it all started. So as a second album, if you find yourself really liking Yes, I think this is a great place to go. It's also a personal favorite favorite of mine. Okay, next up we moved to 1975 for Led Zeppelin's Physical Graffiti, their sixth studio album. 16 million copies sold in the U.S. So after starting with four, which contains their biggest song and definitely most overplayed song, Stairway to Heaven, um, it is time for the what I think is the culmination of everything Led Zeppelin with this double album, physical graffiti. For the album itself, it was very interesting how they came up and did this. The band wrote eight new songs, but it amounted to three sides of an LP. So they decided to add seven more songs and round it out into a double album. Those additional seven songs actually came as outtakes from other things. And in all, this album here ended up becoming a tour de force album covering a lot of different styles for the band. You had the regular standard rock, then hard rock, they have progressive rock, orchestral rock, folk music on here with some real standout tracks like The Rover, which was an outtake from Houses of the Holy, Cashmere, one of the most progressive pieces that they've ever written, uh, Down by the Seaside, which was an outtake from Ford, just showing you the quality of material that even outtakes were really, really amazing stuff. So this one here, because of that whole variety and different errors that it covers on here and being a double album, I think is a great second album to move into for Led Zeppelin. All right, moving into 1976, 
Yes, with 2112. This one here is the reissue, which, ha which was why it has slightly different artwork on it. It was their fourth studio album at the time. Uh, it's gone on to sell 3 million copies in the U.S. So after getting that introduction through the album, like Moving Pictures in 1981 that has all the radio hits on it and everything, let's move back in time now to their prog roots with this masterpiece of an album. And so while it doesn't really have the radio staples the way that Moving Pictures does, it does feature the 20-minute epic title track that opens the album on side one. The whole second side of this album has uh, so shorter songs on it, but it does have some pretty well-known radio songs on it like Passage to Bangkok and Tears, uh, both of which uh, I don't think get played enough live and would love it if they would do it or would have done it a lot more. You know, unfortunately, Rush hung it up in 2015, although there's a lot of rumblings right now as to whether or not Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson could go out on the road. And if they do, maybe they'll play some lesser known Rush songs in their uh, repertoire. Be really cool. All right, moving into 1977, Pink Floyd Animals, 10th studio album, has sold 4 million copies in the U.S. So after listening to, uh, you know, the album that has spent the longest time on the Billboard charts, Dark Side of the Moon, uh, it is time to really go where the band, uh, you know, sunk its teeth into some meat and potatoes of the progressive rock movement that Pink Floyd was part of. For this one here, it's a cover or a concept album loosely based on George Orwell's uh, political fable, Animal Farm. And it focuses on the social political uh, conditions of the day at that time. It features five tracks on it, but songs number one and five are really the same song, Pigs on the Wing, and they kind of act as an intro and outro. So there's really only three songs on this one here, but I really like them because again, they're the meat and potatoes. You can sink your teeth into them. You've got Dogs, which is 17 minutes, Pigs, three different ones, which is 11 minutes, and Sheep, which is 10 minutes. And as I said, it's the meat and potatoes. I can sink my teeth into those songs. They're not the ones that are overplayed on the radio. So, you know, after you kind of get tired of the radio hits, the songs that you know, if you want to hear stuff that's really kind of truly new to you, picking up this album to explore this is going to be that for you. And again, I think it makes a great second album to dive into by Pink Floyd, something very, very different than Dark Side of the Moon that has those much shorter songs on it. That's what a lot of this is. Second album albums where we're moving into a lot of different territory by these great, amazing artists. All right, 1978, Bruce Springsteen, Darks, uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town, his fourth studio album, 3 million copies sold in the U.S. So after listening to his biggest album, Born in the USA, which had sold 17 million copies in the U.S., uh, just really right place, right time kind of thing. This album here, I, I think, is where it really all came together. It really all started for him, in my opinion. I know the Born to Run album before that, but this album here for me is uh, really the culmination of all of that. And when it was released, there was it had been a three-year gap since Born on the Run due to legal battles and other stuff that was going on. So it was kind of a monumental thing when it dropped. And um, a lot of praise for the maturity and change and lyrical content and everything at the time for what he was doing. It's got the songs Badlands, Racing in the Street, The Promised Land, and Prove It All Night. I just always felt that this album sort of perfected the Heartland Rock style that he would go on to continue to do to even bigger degree like on Born on the Run. Uh, sorry, Born to Run. Uh, on Born in the USA. But this here is a great further introduction into the boss going back even further. It's not going to be too much different than Born in the USA, but in my opinion, it's where it all started and a great place to go for that second album. All right, so when we did, uh, you know, the best first albums to start with, and I went with ACDC's Back in Black, I think, you know, in my opinion, you had to go with that, but for all of you out there that are Bon Scott fans, for a second album, if you've got the Brian Johnson, now you've got to go Bon Scott, Highway to Hell from 1979, fifth studio album that sold 7 million copies in the U.S. So, you know, this one here is 
a great album to move into after. It doesn't quite have the radio hits that Back in Black has, nor has every song on here been played on the radio, but that, to me, that is a good thing. The album is not quite as worn out. Um, lots and lots of good stuff on this album, though. In particular, I love the song Shot Down in Flames that's on here. Of course, you've got the title track on here, which is just a mega, mega hit. But the production on this album is just another amazing feat, the same way that Back in Black was. We have Robert John Mutt Lang getting in, starting off. Look at the number of albums that he's done that are mega, big, major albums, not just in terms of sales, but in terms of quality. He has certainly touched a lot of them, but just killer, killer classics on this album. There's also a lot of great deep cuts on this one, personal favorites like Get It Hot and Night Prowler on here. So this whole album is great from start to finish, similar in the vein of Back in Black, but just not as many uh, radio hits on it, though I think it makes for a great second album. Okay, next one, we move into 1984, and you've got Van Halen 1984. How can we cover the year 1984 without the album that has it for the name? So six studio album, 10 million copies sold in the U.S. after exploring the debut album. The thing that started it all, that spurred it along. What be better way to do than to go to their culmination with David Lee Roth at the peak of their prowess with David Lee Roth. Unfortunately, it'd be the last to feature David Lee Roth too. But this album, a tour de force in and of itself, um, from those opening synthesizer chords for the instrumental song 1984 much in the same way that we have the guitar solo eruption on the debut for me that was what this was when i first heard it it was just an entirely new thing that you knew something huge was about to come something new was about to come down the road and that's exactly what happened here creating a big shift for van halen uh, of course they move into the poppy keyboard late in jump but it was fantastically done as only van halen can merge pop and rock into one song and they just kept right on going into the driving sounds of panama so the first three tracks on this album were amazing songs on here and they continue it up with more stuff like Hot for Teacher, I'll Wait, all making this one here an amazing album within their catalog and a great second album to move into. But quite honestly, any of the band's first six albums could have easily been another one to purchase from them. I'm just choosing to go with 1984. All right, next up, we move into 1987 with Fleetwood Mac, Tango in the Night, 14 studio album, 3 million copies sold in the U.S. So after you pick up the most popular Fleetwood Mac album ever, Rumors, and one of the biggest all-time selling albums ever, for me, this comeback album here, the, the band's popularity had waned after Tusk and Mirage, but this album here really restored it in my opinion. Uh, it's also the most polished sounding album in their career, but I think it was done amazingly well. At the time, it was the last to feature Lindsey Buckingham until this reunion with the band a decade later in 1997. It's got major hits on it. Little Lies was top 10 at number four. You got another top 10 with Big Love at number five. That one would later be re-recorded as an acoustic version by Lindsey Buckingham appearing in the soundtrack to Elizabethtown, which is actually what introduced me to it. Everywhere was a top uh, 20 hit at number 14, and Seven Wonders, another top 20 at 19. So four top 20 songs on this album alone, even though it didn't sell the mega numbers the way Rumors did, a super popular album in and of itself. It really gave a new vibe to the band, and you know, beyond their most famous album, I think this one here is a great place to go for the second album of Fleetwood Mac in your collection. Okay. Next up, we're moving into 1989. We got Aerosmith, Pump, 10th studio album selling 7 million copies in the U.S. You know, after getting their classic sound from the 70s era in albums like Rocks or whether you chose to start with Toys in the Attic or something else in there, for me at least, I think it's time to move into the biggest album of the 80s. 
and where they reinvented themselves as kings of glam metal. A lot of people don't want to admit it, but this is a glam metal album. It's just their version of a glam metal album. And they did it amazing, adding uh, lots of keyboards, and they bring in other things like horns to this, really helping to make a modern era sounding album. But yet they kept all the cool things that made them who they were, like the tongue in cheek lyrics, the rock and roll swagger, just all the killer stuff from the, the 70s era that made them big. Now, the thing is, they had three top 10 Billboard Hot 100 hits on this. Jenny Got Your Gun went to number four. Love in an Elevator went to number five. And What It Takes was number nine. So three top 10 hits on this album. So all in all, the lyrics and the music for me really match up on this album here. You got sexy lyrics, sultry music. It's a perfect uh, collision of all of that stuff on here. It's socially conscious. It's got dramatic music. It's got romantic lyrics with uh, moving music. The album itself is a complete package, and that has always been one of the key things for me. What defines making an album a perfect album or one that should be bought either first or second? It is that complete package, and this album is one of them, just like when I talked about rocks in the first uh, episode of this. All right, the last one we're talking about here comes from 1991, Guns N' Roses' Use Your Illusion 1, third studio album, released the same day as Use Your Illusion 2. This has gone on to sell 7 million copies in the U.S. So after the uh, genre-defining uh, album and the biggest-selling debut album of all time, Appetite for Destruction, after you've devoured that and you need something else, you know, for me at least, this is a great album to see where the band settled into who they are today. Even though they haven't released that many albums, you know, Appetite was a flash in the pan. It was uh, capturing the zeitgeist of a perfect sleaze rock glam metal era sound right there, 1986, 1987. And then after that, they settled into a more traditional rock band, a hard rock band. And that's what this really is here, where really the piano, the keyboards, and horns, and all that other stuff that they now do really kind of came out on this album. It was the first one to feature Matt Sorum on drums, Dizzy Reed on keyboards. The album is far more focused and consistent, in my opinion, than Use Your Illusion 2. Even though Use Your Illusion 2 has a couple, couple of mega hits on it, like Civil War, Knocking on Heaven's Door, stuff like that. Those were songs, though, that was released before it. They just added those to it, so not really part of it, in my opinion. It's sort of a hodgepodge album. This one has a much more consistent feel as an album. I feel like if they had only released one of these, it would have been Use Your Illusion 1. Um, and so this one here's got Don't Cry, November Rain, Live and Let Die. But the rest of the album, again, is really strong. In fact, I like the other songs on here far better than the singles off of it, like Bad Obsession, Back Off Bitch, Double Talk and Jive. I think those songs are even better than what was released as the singles on here. And so any number of songs on this could have come from Appetite. In fact, a lot of these were actually written before Appetite. They just didn't make it onto that album. November Rain was a song that was kicking around before that, but they decided to hold on to it till later on. So with songs like uh, Bad Obsession and I think even Back Off Bitch, maybe even Double Talk and Jive. Can't remember. But I know that a number of these were all written beforehand. They had about uh, 25 songs for Appetite that they whittled down to what made that album. So I think that is why this album here is as good as it is, even if it's maybe a little more overproduced than Appetite was. But it makes a great second album to explore by Guns N' Roses. And there you go. Those are the 10 best second albums to buy from the biggest bands. As a reminder, uh, that first video that I filmed, 10 first albums to buy by the biggest bands is out there and available. I'm going to leave a link in the description and you can play between those two as to what you think are the best and greatest albums from these bands. And hey, if both of these uh, episodes do pretty well, maybe I'll do the 10 third albums to buy by the biggest bands because a lot of these bands have been around kicking for 50 plus years and have tons of albums and plenty that we could certainly go down this rabbit hole on. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Take care, have a good one, and I'll talk to you real soon.